Hi everyone, thank you so very much for joining me for another episode of Screw the Cubicle TV. I'm Lydia Lee, the freedom instigator and business coach at Screw the Cubicle. And today's episode is a special one because I get to interview a guest expert for the show. And it is someone that I'll introduce to you in a quick minute here. Uh, and I wanted to have her here on the show. Her name's Lisa Carpenter. And I love that she does a lot of work with high achievers, people that are out there doing big things in the world. And high achievers have sort of this thing where we like to do a lot and in achieving the things that we want to do in our lives. But we're also prone to burnout and doing too much or keeping busy in order to feel productive. So all of you listening might be up and coming and budding entrepreneurs, or maybe you are an entrepreneur, but you're finding hard to create some balance in your life and your career. And if so, this today's episode is for you. Um, I was really interested to share Lisa's interview with you today because I know that the journey to start a business, to have a business is no joke. It tests you in all sorts of ways. And one of the big skill sets and tools that we need to build a muscle around is the skill of emotional resilience. Lisa and I talk a lot about that, especially for high achievers, how we can navigate the change and uncertainty of starting a business and being a business owner, and how we can maintain a level of feeling that we can let things be easy in our work, in our business. Now, for all of you that are like me, high achievers that like to do all the things and feel productive in that, but somehow not feeling good about our out outcomes or being hard on ourselves, this episode is so, so important for us to really be talking about. So what I really hope that you get from this interview is that when you create big things in your life, right, whether it's a life transition, a career transition, or building a business, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a healthy and sustainable way. And Lisa is so good at giving us some great insights, some new perspective about how we can achieve results and success in whatever we want to do in our lives without giving up our self-care, right? Our good practices that makes us feel good about what we're doing. Um, and to really build that muscle for resilience, which is what we're going to talk about today. Thanks for being here. And like, I've been actually like, like when I emailed you, I was going through your website and it's looked a lot more different than when I first oh. saw it a few years ago. And we had our chat as well privately in our little session. Uh, but I was like, great. I love the fact that you are now really supporting really powerful and amazing people doing really big things and great things in the world, mm -hmm. but doing it in a way that isn't going to be this hustle mentality that we're used to seeing in the digital marketing world. And I, for one, am kind of tired of doing more to achieve more, right? So part of this uh, interview, Lisa, is really for me. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Uh, and wanting you on board as well, because, you know, your um, wisdom and your insights would be really helpful for me. Uh, but let's get started with sort of your story. You know, I, I, I knew you actually in the beginning of time uh, through our mutual friend, Adrian, right? Mm -hmm. And where I sort of saw you helping a lot, it was around, you know, women's fitness, and nutrition and their self image. And then we actually had a conversation when I was having some trouble of like, what's enough for me and what, why am I feeling so burnt out and, and heavy? Uh, but I'm curious to know sort of how your work has mer like merged and shifted and expanded since the last time we talked. And for people who don't know you, tell us a little bit about why you do what you do and the purpose of your work. Wow. All the questions, all the questions. Such, such great questions. So yeah, my work has evolved. And for the longest time I felt a little bit lost because I'm like, well, I'm not really doing this thing, but it's still important meaning nutrition and, and fitness, but what is, what is really my bigger message? So when I first started my business and I've been an entrepreneur for almost two decades now, which is like mind blowing. Um, it really was based around teaching women how to take better care of themselves in terms of their nutrition and weight loss. And that was really my big focus. And as my career expanded and life changed, I learned a lot of things about weight loss and nutrition that had nothing to do with food primarily around what we're using food to numb out and that our weight is often just a symptom of how we're not truly showing up in our lives. 
right? So our bodies represent what we're thinking and feeling and our beliefs on the inside. So my work continued to expand and I stepped into new branding that I call Full Frontal Living because I really help high achieving driven women who are kind of burnt out with no way out, right? They're constantly chasing that next thing, looking for fulfillment, happiness, joy, constantly seeking, but never really getting there, so to speak, right? Mm. So full frontal living is all about these pillars of self-care, not as something you do, but as a way of being. It's how we matter in our own lives. So I was able to marry this piece around, okay, let's, let's look at food and let's look at how we use it. But let's also look at how our emotions are playing a role in this, Mm. how we're not allowing ourselves to feel our feelings. So emotional resiliency, connection, like how connected are we to ourselves? Because as high achievers, like I said, we're looking for for fulfillment in the things we're doing, not in who we're being. Mm. We we put no, we think that we're going to find our self-worth and our value out there instead of realizing it's in here. And this is why no amount of achievement or boxes ticked will ever make you feel better because that's your responsibility. And then the last pillar of full frontal living is about rest and play. Like what it looks like to actually have fun because we're not here to like work ourselves to the bone and to exhaustion and do all the things. Um, And so many of us, we don't value rest. Yeah. You know, we burn the candle at both ends. We work all hours and then we get up and do it again. And we're juggling kids and we're juggling work and we're juggling all these things when really we just need to slow down and tune in and remember mm. what it feels like to live. Cause we're not here to be human doings. We're here to be human beings. Oh, so powerful. Love your work. I love my work, but you have to love who you are more. Mm. And so many of us don't understand that the reason we feel stuck or trapped in our jobs or why can't we move forward is because we actually don't value ourselves. We're struggling with low self-worth and low self-esteem under the surface. But I mean, who wants to wake up and admit that to themselves? Yeah, that's true. And then I think when people, you know, we we talked about this a little bit uh, in the beginning of uh, when we jumped on this call, it's like, sometimes it could be like a... um, actually being an entrepreneur and wanting to start a business or, 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 or involving yourself with a big venture can be a way of escaping something, right. That you might need to face. Like, let's talk a bit about that actually, because it's kind of a good place to start to sort of like gauge and, and, and check in with the intention of, of why you are actually investing energy, time, and money into a new business. I mean, both you and I, I mean, you've been in entrepreneurship for way longer than I have. Uh, but I can, I, I can totally see that when I first originally started quitting my job or wanting to quit my job was actually, I wanted to just get out. And then you know, I didn't really question what was, you know, uh, what my own responsibility was in a way of making my own unhappiness happen. It was re- a lot easier to just sort of blame the hours <laughs> and blame the shitty boss. Uh, right. and of course I love, entrepreneurship now, but it's no joke. Like we were just saying, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. It, it, I almost look at, um, when I think about my first year of entrepreneurship, I feel like one year of a startup is like 10 years of therapy because it brings out so much shit into the forefront that you have to face that you can no longer blame other people for, you know, and, and you've obviously been working with a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of high achieving creator, creators and makers, you know, what have you sort of found out has been sometimes the ways of that they've used entrepreneurship, have used the business as a way to escape something deeper that they should be looking at. Right. So I've had multiple clients that have come to me and said, you know, I need your help. I need to be more rested uh, because, you know, I want to start this new thing. And I'm like, maybe starting the new thing really isn't what you need. Because if there's this belief of when then, right? When I'm out of my job, when I start this new thing, then I'm going to feel good. Then I'm going to feel better. Then I'm going to have lots of time for myself, right? Never happens in entrepreneurship. So it really is about taking a look at, are you just trying to hop over the fence thinking the grass will be greener on the other side? Because starting a new venture uh, is not you know, if you're looking for more freedom and you're wanting to feel more connected and more fulfilled, starting a new job or becoming an entrepreneur isn't necessarily the way 
to get there. My first question would be is, well, what are you doing in your life right now that makes you feel connected mm-hmm. to you and fulfilled? Because if you're running on the hamster wheel, being a CEO or you know working your corporate job and you're working all hours of the night, I guarantee you when you become an entrepreneur, those behaviors will follow you because they're habits. They're not going away and they'll actually get worse because now you can't even bark about your boss. Like you are your boss. And I know a lot of things about high achievers, me being one, is we will be harder on ourselves than anybody. We will drive ourselves so hard, which is not which is not helpful. So it's really looking at if you're if you're feeling unfulfilled in your job, your business, is taking a step back and saying, like, what would make me happy? Like, what brings me joy in my life? Do I have space for myself? Am I willing to make that space for myself now? Mm. What do I want my life to look like? Because you really have to uh, work backwards. You have to create the vision that you want for your life. And I'm not just talking about your work, like your life. Like, how do you want to be in your life with your kids, your family, your travel, whatever. And you have to work backwards from that. Um, there's a reason why I don't launch big programs anymore, why I just took a break from that. I only work one-to-one because I love the freedom that one-to-one work gives me. But one of my coaches was like, well, that's not scalable. I'm like, well, how much do I need to scale? Like, I don't know about you. I'm about, you know, I'm happy to make all the money, but I look at my life and say, what is the most valuable thing for me right now? And in this moment, I want to have a flexible schedule. I want to do intimate work. I want to be able to move people around. I want time with my family. So yes, some would argue that scaling and doing all this other stuff will give me more of that, but I don't want to put in the time for that right now because what's happening right now in my life, I want my time and space for that. Mm. So that's the, what I look at. I help people look at what, it, what is it that they really, really want And let's get clear on that. So I have one client right now. This is the first summer because she came to me and she was all ready to start a new project. I'm like, maybe that's not what you need. And I was the first person to say to her, like, have you considered (laughs) slowing your role? Because she's telling me she's burnt out and she's having health problems and all this stuff. And I just said, you know, what is it going to cost you? Mm. Like, what is it going to cost you to start a new venture? So we worked together for 12 months. And uh, this is the first summer she spent with her son, hanging out with him, boating, having fun, right? She's managed to now pull herself out of her existing job, right? So instead of dropping it and burning it down, she's pulled herself out of it. She is still going to start a new venture, but she's going to do it from a different energy now. And she's Mm -hmm. very clear on what her boundaries are, what she's going to be saying yes to, what she's going to be saying no to. Um... And what is most important for her as she grows that new venture? So it's mm. a completely different energy instead of a. Escape. I love that. Right. Yeah, I love that, and, and I totally. And I think that is something we do have to take that pause. It's a necessary pause that we need to take before we start something new like a business, because that you're you're so right to say that you got to be building. You have to be building something that serves the values of how you want to live your life right? A lot of people think, and and I was definitely a victim of that, is that I will just automate and scale and do the thing I need to do and learn all the things. And then I can relax and then enjoy my business. But that never came. And actually last November, which I wrote a very open um, 2018 wrap up blog post about this was that I went through such a massive burnout that came out of nowhere for me, like, or I felt came out of nowhere. It was a long time coming, I'm sure. And I numbed myself enough to not realize the signs because I have been in the standard of operation for so long that I, that was normalized for me. We normalize things. We normalize stuff as high achievers that other people look at us and they're, they're like, you're, you're crazy. That's not normal. And we're like, yes, it is totally normal. It's not normal. Absolutely. And I love the idea that you, you know, or what you do with your clients with the boundaries. Cause I think that was, that is one of the things that aren't spoken about as much when we think about business building. You know, the minute you start to go on YouTube or Google or Facebook and you start typing in business strategy, right. Or how to launch a business and guess how cool you get, you get funnels 101, right. You get you got to write the most snazzy copywriting to attract the right clients. You have to have the best website. And there's all these external things 
that you're supposed to learn and have and be really good at <laughs> to be the next Marie Forleo, whoever it is that's being featured as the shining goddess of right. the business world. And so it's hard to measure up and live up to those things in a lot of ways. And I have a lot of clients that are Marie Forleo fan. I mean, I am, I'm a huge Marie Forleo fan, but I always have to remember to tell them, um, you're, you are trying to do all the things Marie's doing when she has a team. She's been 12 years in the business and you're in grade one when she's in grade 12. Right. And so you're comparing yourself to the wrong person. And ultimately you need to define what it is that you want to build so that you can actually have the kind of life that you want, which might be very different from Marie Forleo's. <laughs> exactly. Right. It, you got to be very careful about the Kool-Aid that you drink mm. because we are really sold that you just, you just move your business online and you do these things and you're going to make all the money and you're going to have your laptop at the beach. I'm never working at the beach. If I go to the beach, it's because I'm there to get a tan. Okay. Exactly. Like I work when I work and I play when I play and there's boundaries around that for me. Right. So we do have to start where we're at, where we're at. And we do have to make the decision about, you know, I, I talk about doing less better. Mm. What is the one thing that you can do that's going to move the needle in your business? Not all the things, because when you try and do all the things, you're buying into this belief that if I do more, I'll get there faster. Mm. And you're going to get there wherever there is, because I still haven't gotten there because as high achievers, what do we do? Like we're constantly moving the bar, right? Our dreams get bigger and bigger and bigger. You're going to get there at the rate that the universe chooses to put you there. So as much as you think like, I'm going to force this and control this, and I'm going to grow my business faster, you're going to have the journey that you're meant to have. I'm no longer willing to tolerate throwing myself and my physical and emotional health under the bus mm. for to get there because my life is happening right now and I want to be in it right now. I'm not waiting till there. So mm. it's this balance of I still very much am a doer and I have to be very disciplined around the things that I do, but the things that I do, it's a short list and I do them every day, and then I track how they are helping my business move. Mm. I let go of, you need the funnel, you need the this, you need the that. And I sat back and said, what do I want to do? Because this right. is my business, right? My business. And nobody knows the best strategy for me, but me, right? So I can talk to advisors like you and other people, but at the end of the day, I have to sit back and say, what is the best strategy for me? That's so right. last year when I made the decision, I'm only working one-to-one, -one, I got pushback from some of my mentors. Mm. I simply said, it's, it's not a block, right? We talk about blocks and sometimes there is resistance. It wasn't resistance. It was being very clear on what I wanted. I wasn't saying I was never going to do it because I did just launch a group program. It went really well and it was super easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just focused on, I'm going to give myself 12 months to only do the things that I really love. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean I don't do things that I don't super love, right? Like there's things in our business we have to do. Yeah. Um, and I let it unfold the way it was meant to unfold. And with much less effort, because I'm doing what I love and I'm enjoying the ride instead of forcing and pushing and trying to control, my business is doing amazing things. And I love sitting down at my desk every day when I get to work. Yeah. I love that, that honoring of like, this is what you do best. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you went, went to primarily focusing on one-on-one -on -one because I had this, this thought as well for the last two years of my business before the meltdown <laughs> in November, I was scaling. It's what you do. It's what you do in a coaching business, what they tell you to do. Uh, and I, I too had a lot of fun running, uh, you know, big academy programs and having groups and having a community, but where I actually felt the most fulfilled was when I was deep diving with one client, solving one problem in one hour. And there's so much completion there that I felt that I, you know, had that accountability to, to this person for that hour, which felt so good and right, fulfilling and purposeful than just trying to make more money from, for less time at times, you know? Um, I want to talk about one of the, the lasting mantras that you sort of left with me a few years back when we had uh, our little session as well. And I, and I, I think about it often when I'm about to execute <laughs> on an action. Uh, and, and this is the mantra of what you say a lot to many of your clients, which is let it be easy. 
Now, this is a really nice, sexy line. And when we hear it, we go, yes, let it be easy. But what does it really mean? Because some people could say it means, oh, I just sort of sit there and let the universe come to me. And I just, it won't just happen. And, you know, we know this word manifestation and we hear it all the time. And we have read the secret and watched all the videos. And sometimes we just sit there. And that may not always be the, the, the best case scenario either. And then there's, you know, we think about, well, what, is that, what does that mean for a high achiever? person. Like, I have not done that before. How do I recondition myself to let things be easy? What does that look like, actually, in mm -hmm. real life? Uh, and how does one benefit from using this practice in making decisions in their business? That's a really great question. So there's a, an old proverb that I read that said, when you pray, move your feet. So manifestation isn't about sitting back and just like oming your way to things happening. It's about co-creating with the universe, which sounds a little bit woo, but it's it's literally about letting yourself have your dreams and understanding that you don't have to do all the heavy lifting, but you do have to put the wheels in motion, right? You have to set your intention. You have to put the wheels in motion. Love that. Letting it be easy means that you literally look at how simple can I make it to get from point A to point B, right? And as, as high achievers, overachievers, what we typically do is overthink things. We think and we think and we think and we think and we think. And we can't think our way to solutions, so to speak, right? Sometimes we have to sit back and feel into it. So letting it be easy for me, it's, it's constantly looking at where can I let go? What things am I holding on to? What things can I hand over? What things do I have no control over? So even with this last uh, recent launch that I did and letting it be easy, I really thought about, you know, how do I want to get my message out into the world? What is the easiest way for me to do this where I don't feel like it's going to take up tons of time out and I'm going to enjoy doing it? So I launched a podcast. Easiest thing I do in my business. Scariest thing every single time I hit publish, but the easiest thing I do because I let myself talk about whatever I want. I gave myself full permission. We're just going to talk about these pillars of full frontal living and we'll see where it goes. And sometimes I go off on tangents. People love it. It's grown my audience, right? Easy. No funnel, no fancy setup. I record it on Anchor on my phone. Nobody edits it for me. I hit a button, publish. Like I write my show notes after I record. So that's no fancy need. jingles. No fancy jingles. I don't have some fancy intro, outro. Maybe one day. But for right now, it was about, I just need to put it out into the world. And if I get caught in the perfectionism and the details, I'm making what could be simple challenging because I'm more worried about it, what it looks like than letting it be easy. So that's one um, example. And when I launched this program, I literally lead page, shot a video. This is what it's about. This is what it's going to look like. Wrote some copy. There's a buy now button. Put a price on it. That was it. There was no fancy like, we got to have a four week runway and then we got a three part video series. No. There's a big countdown that has an no. emergency. No. <laughs> This is when we're starting. You have until this day to get in. Yeah. And yeah. I just let it fly. And I didn't worry about the outcome. I didn't overthink. Like I just said, you know what? Whatever's meant to happen with this will happen. And the right women, the women who are meant to be in that room will be there. And I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not, not going to do anything. I just want this to be easy. Mm. Because it was about putting myself back out there again in terms of having a, a group program. So I did it and it was great. It was successful. We're in the middle of it and I'm loving it. And again, how easy did I make this? Ladies, I'm not sending you any emails. There's no membership to log into. This will be the Facebook group. Here's the file. This is where you're going to find your daily activity. We're going to do some Facebook lives. We'll do some Zoom calls and that's it. Yeah. I don't need to give you more. You don't need more. Just do your homework and that's it. Right. So it hasn't been this like, oh my God, I need graphics and I need things and I need, no. Mm -hmm. So it's a practice for me to constantly be stepping back in my business and saying, where am I overthinking? Where am I overdoing? Where do I need to let go? What can I just surrender and say, I have no control over this. 
and not complicate it because when we, when we overdo, that's when we reach burnout. Mm, absolutely. When we become unwell. Absolutely. And I think that's such a great way to do it because you're not saying to avoid doing hard things or challenging things because no. sometimes the challenging things that we do in our business are the things that we grow into and everything feels unfamiliar all the time. Right. <laughs> it and we can matter. do, we can do hard things with ease. Yes. Right. Love it's that. the energy that you bring to your doing, right? So you can come to work like stressed out or strung out. Or you can come to work and just say, I'm going to be calm. I'm going to be at peace. I don't love this particular task. It might not feel good, but you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to be peaceful with it. I'm going to let it be easy, get it done and get out. Love it. Right. Yeah. So really tune into the energy you're bringing because, you know, this is just such a cool story. I was, I was recently in Texas. I got picked up by an Uber driver, as we get to do when we're not in Vancouver, because we don't have yeah, that's Uber. right. <laughs> um, he was such an amazing man. He left Venezuela, I believe it was Venezuela, because of the political climate. So he gave up his profession as a professor, university, highly educated man, driving an Uber. He brought his family here because his his family's lives were threatened, and you know. He, his personal life was threatened and he went and worked at Amazon and he packed, he packed boxes for Amazon over the night shift so he could get his, you know, social insurance so he could get enough credit so he could buy a car so he could drive people from the airport because he figured out if he picks people up from the airport, they're not going to be drunk coming from the bar. They're going to be professionals. So he could drive people and he literally like, are you okay? Can I turn up the air conditioning, down the air conditioning? He's practicing his English. He could get in that car every day and be so resentful that he's driving an Uber when he was a university professor, mm -hmm. but he has made the choice to love what he does, even though it's not what he wants to do. And because he brings that energy to his work, right? It's, he's choosing that because mm. driving an Uber all day long and talking to strangers when English is not your first language, right? And I'm sure he's got his own emotional stuff that he's had to work through around that. But the energy that he brought to his job, I felt that. And if we could all just show up and realize that, that the things that we are hating so much about our lives, they're somebody else's dreams, Somebody else is dreaming of the life that you're trying to run away from. So hit the pause button, tune in, see like where you are making it harder than it needs to be, mm. where you can take responsibility because it's not about your boss or the job or anything. You are creating your life by the energy that you bring to it, by the interpretations you're attaching to it. Step that, take responsibility because there's a lot that you can do that will change your current circumstances without you necessarily starting a new career. I'm not saying like, don't do that. I'm all for entrepreneurship. But I think that there's a level of responsibility about stepping back. And like we started yeah. this call, what and do you really want? want? Yeah. And how, what you bring into your business. I mean, if you're coming at it where it's just desperate, panicked, it better work out or else sort of energy, your business won't thrive anyway. No, because That's you're coming at it from lack and survival and I right. have to make this work, which means yeah. you're focused on lack and survival and it not working instead of working from possibility and faith and surrender. Mm. Yeah, right? absolutely. So surrender is a practice and it's, it's like a, it's a business strategy for me. Surrender, Lisa. Mm. What do you need to let go of in this moment? Because you're trying to control something you have no control over. I don't have, have any control over how many people are going to sign up for my program. That's right. Surrender and just let it be because that's what puts me in this place of being peaceful. Mm. And my peace of, of mind and my physical and emotional well being is my number one priority. Yep. 100%. And you don't want to bring that into the start of a business because it's hard enough. Oh and gosh, yes. Working out, you know, we, we go to the gym and we do all sorts of things to get our bodies into shape. And all sorts of things, right? For self care. <laughs> uh, and, but in terms of our emotions and, and our feelings, this is something we don't have like an emotion gym, 
<laughs> you know, to go to. Well, I wish that that could be a great business idea to have like emotional resilience gym. <laughs> a gym for your mind <laughs> would right. be so lovely. So I want to talk a little bit about emotional resilience mm -hmm. for years, since we've been talking a bit about this, about boundaries, right? About um, really cultivating this new attitude, right? Sort of like that part of the Caribbean movie, you know, when Jack Sparrow is like saying, I think his line was like, you know, the problem is not the problem, is the is your attitude about the problem. Oh my God, right? I love that. So that, and that, that, that is probably one of the only lines that I liked about Jack, Jack Sparrow, but it's, it's, it's a real good one for the reality check for our lives. Um, so, you know, this has been such a buzzword, right? Emotional resilience. We've watched Ted talks about it. We've watched Brene Brown talk about vulnerability and, you know, stepping into your power in the arena. And we are all sort of gung ho, right? When it comes to wanting to read more and do more about it. Uh, but when it comes time to actually utilize emotional resilience, we're not really sure what the hell we're doing because we weren't educated very much. I mean, I wish we taught this more in schools, you know, when, uh, when kids have the ability and the openness to absorb this in the beginning and, and for adults as well. Um, but why, why do you think emotional resilience is important for sort of like the high achieving go-getter folks in particular? Um, because I think there's this misunderstanding that people have about emotional resilience sometimes because we have certain influencers, we won't say those names, who they are, but people can probably guess who they are, that will say, you know, things like just hustle and get over it. And, you know, in a way, avoid the feeling of that discomfort because what's the point of wasting all that time drilling into that? Let's just get over it and make it another day, right? right. And that's sort of sometimes the, the, the um, yeah, the people that we, we see going on out there talking about this message. So can you explain to us sort of like how can we cultivate emotional resilience in a healthy way without bypassing what it is that we need to take a look at when we're, when we're learning of how we want to go through a, a hard time that we're experiencing? This is a great question. You're a great interviewer. Oh, good. <laughs> so emotional resiliency. Yeah, there's a lot of messages out there like just put your head down and get it done, right? Get it done. When you're little, it's like you skin your knee and your mom's like, just suck it up. Don't cry. And boys especially get this message, right? Oh, a Asian families are right. all this. We yeah, just, talk about it. We just don't talk about it. <laughs> no, don't talk about it. We're not going to talk about our feelings. We're all going to walk around like cyborgs. So what we're taught from a really early age is that our feelings don't matter and our thinking matters. So override what you're feeling and just get it done. So there is, and getting things done, how do I want to say this? We have to do things when we don't necessarily feel like it. Let's just be clear on that, okay? But the ability to actually connect into what you're feeling, acknowledge it, move through it, and still go do the thing is what emotional resiliency is about. Beautiful. It's not about stuffing it down because if you try and stuff down what you're feeling, you're going to find yourself overeating, numbing out on social media, drugs, alcohol, over-exercising, people-pleasing, controlling, approval-seeking. So we've got substance abuse and we have process abuse, which is these behaviors that come up. So our emotions are here to help guide us through life and we can't think our way through our feelings. So what I teach my clients to do is start to get out of their heads and get into their hearts. And when I was first taught this, when my counselor first said this to me, I'm like, what does that even mean? Get out of my head and get into my heart. I wanted to punch her in the face. I was like, <laughs> like, tell me what to do, which is what my clients sit in what front of me. They're like, yeah. they're like, give me the action plan, Lisa, so I can go tick the boxes. I'm like, this is not a box ticking exercise. It's about actually tuning into your emotions because especially as women, right? We've, we've flipped into this. We've got to be more like men if we're going to be successful. So we get caught in our masculine energy, which is powerful and it's seductive because we do lots of things and we're control like, right. It's very, it's very, um, alluring and we think it's a strength. However, as women tapping into our intuition, knowing what our gut is telling us, that is powerful. And so many of us are disconnected to it because we don't know what we're feeling anymore. And we're doing things that disconnect us even more, right? Like we were talking about you being a recovering people pleaser, learning how to say no and being with the discomfort of saying no, you're not going to die. 
but learning that new behavior that it's safe for me to say no. Mm. So what I ask my clients to do, and this is going to sound a little bit woo, but it's so important is to put your hand over your heart, take a deep breath, and then ask yourself, how am I feeling? And pause the same way that you would ask your best friend that you care about, right? Like you ask your best friend how she feels because you care and you genuinely want to know when was the last time you mattered enough in your own life. Mm. Ask yourself how you were feeling, not to judge it, but just to be curious, like, oh, wow, I'm feeling anxious. Cool. Acknowledge that you're feeling anxious. And what do I need to do? This is the next question. What do I need to do to support myself in this moment? Mm. And then do the thing to support yourself. It might be going for a walk. It might be sitting down and writing out all the things you need to do on your to-do list so you can stop feeling anxious about it, Mm. right? It looks different for every single person. But the more that you can tune in and say like, what is it that I'm feeling right now? Your emotions will lead you to what you're thinking. And once you can hear what you're thinking, right? You can dump that crap down on paper and you can look at it and say, is this even true? <laughs> yeah. That's right? right. Because our, I think when it's in your head, it sort of gets mumbled and jumbled in there that you don't really, cons- you don't, cause you, you keep asking why I think that I like the why questions whenever I go into like a shit storm of overthinking, cause there's a hundred things going on in my head. And, right. and that's very likely because there, there hasn't been an outlet <laughs> for me right. to actually take a look at what's going on and also go, why did I feel that way? Why did I feel that way? Why did I say that? You know, wh- why am I feeling these things? And sometimes going down that rabbit hole could actually lead you to the real reason. And sometimes right. it's just, I kind of feel insecure. Exactly. So curiosity will take you a long way. Mm. Not judgment, curiosity. When we allow ourselves to be curious, we discover a lot about ourselves. And believing that you know what you're thinking all the time without writing it down is flawed. So in this program that I'm running, it's all about women connecting in with their physical body right? So a lot of them have struggled to lose weight. I know why they've struggled to lose weight because I know what they're telling themselves all the time. So in this program, every single day, they have a journal prompt and they have to write. The stuff that is coming up for these ladies that they have been telling themselves all along, but they weren't conscious of it, has literally been driving their behaviors. Now that they can see what they've been Mm. thinking, they can tune into what they've been feeling which means they can start to create different habits and behaviors Mm. based on the new beliefs that they're ready to embody. Okay. And this is where people drop the ball on emotional resiliency is they read all the self-help books, which is like, you know, drinking from a fire hose. You don't really get anything. The only way you change, the only way you become more emotionally resilient is by practicing embodying the new ways of being. Mm. And yeah. that's Put theory the, to practice. And that's where it gets uncomfortable, right? Because when you yeah. decide, wow, being a people pleaser is robbing me of my time and energy, I need to say no, right? So I'm going to be more committed to saying yes to me and no to other people. The first time you say no, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. The second time you say no, it still doesn't feel good. I mean, I remember having a huge conversation with a previous um business partner where I had to, I had to give her back a ton of responsibility that I had taken on. She didn't ask me to, I just took it on. Mm. I was in tears. I felt like such a horrible person and how could I do this to her and what was going to happen to her family, but it wasn't my responsibility. And by continuing to take it on, I was paying a price and I was no longer available to pay that price. It didn't feel good, but that conversation was such a massive pattern interrupt for me. Mm. It allowed me to move on and continue to have hard conversations, not attached to how somebody else might feel because of a choice that I'm making. Mm. Um, And that's what, you know, my clients learn to do. They learn how to be present to the discomfort, knowing they're not going to (laughs) die. Right. It feels like it. It does feel like it. It does feel like it. Um, (laughs) Because we, we as humans crave familiarity and mm-hmm. comfort. And the only way to grow is through, you know, destruction and discomfort. 
Totally. Yeah, it's, it, it is a, it's such a journey, isn't it? Because it's not an overnight behavior shift. Like, you know, when you talked about that pattern interrupt that you experienced, I mean, that was probably a few things that have had to happen. And that moment sort of was like, whoa, this one made the difference. <laughs> this punch in my own face made the difference. <laughs> but, you know, it's, but probably very likely it was many months or even years of leading up to that like real powerful no, right? Mm -hmm. The beautiful no right? That new book that's out. Um, and so what I want to actually end the, the interview with a, a quick question about something that I know uh, a lot of high achievers experience, which is their old behaviors. And this is sort of, also sort of my question as well. There's been a time for many years for a high achiever where when they have done all the things, when they have done over and above and beyond expectations, where their standards are super high, they have been rewarded with something, right? Rewarded with respect, status, um, to be the influencer, the expert, the genius. And there's a sense of pride with that role, you know, of being admired and respected. So the question is that when people, you know, say that, okay, I don't want to be attached to these outcomes, right? That I, that, that only the outcomes are what brings me pleasure, right? Because my outcomes seem to be the only things I hold on to that make me feel happy because high achievers are always talking about the destination and never the journey, right? You know, but all those things has kind of served me though. Like I kind of gained something. I gained money, I gained prestige, status, whatever it is that I gained. It kind of worked for me. How do I even begin, right? To let it be easy and do things in a completely different manner when I kind of achieved things and it worked for me. How do I redefine that version of success going forward? Right. So there's nothing wrong with achieving things and there's nothing wrong with getting high fives and admiration from other people. But if you're unwilling to give it to yourself, that's where you're dropping the ball, mm. right? Because if you're constantly chasing achievement and success and somebody else telling you you're good enough, you're going to always have to feed that addiction right? You're always going to be looking for something outside yourself. So as high achievers, part of our responsibility is learn to learn how to celebrate ourselves, to learn how to celebrate our own accomplishments, big, small, everything in between. So I still, you know, when somebody says to me, Lisa, you have, you've made an impact on my life. Of course, that fills my heart. That's what I'm here to do. But I have to know I've impacted people's lives even when nobody tells me because I choose to, and I choose to celebrate that. So I no longer look for my worth outside of myself. Mm. That is my responsibility. Am I still wanting to achieve big things? Yeah. But I no longer keep moving the bar on myself because that's what would happen. I do this thing, right? And I get close to like hitting that goal. And then I would just make the goal bigger. So right. I never felt like I was really accomplishing things. So mm. even in that sense, right, people would tell me, wow, you're doing amazing things. But because I wasn't celebrating myself, it still wasn't quite good enough. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, in the addiction recovery community, there's a saying that one is too many and 10,000 is never enough. Mm -hmm. And with achievers, where we've hung all our worth on the things we do and the things we've accomplished, it doesn't matter how much we accomplish in our lives. It's never going to truly fulfill us unless yeah. we find out what we need on the inside to feel fulfilled. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was amazing. I mean, I honestly would have loved to talk for another two hours with you. And this is why I, pro I probably need a podcast. <laughs> So it can give me permission to actually go the length that I need to go because I'm also a bit of a, a deep diver like you. <laughs> Do it. You know what? It is, it is the most fun. And I don't think that there is anything more impactful. And I am so honored that people take time out of their week to plug me into their ears wow. every week. Like when I think about that, that's amazing to me that I go along on people's walks and I'm in the kitchen with them and I'm in, on the gym doing the treadmill thing with them. Um, I think it's an amazing way to connect with our community. And I know yeah. the high achievers, because they're always looking for time, they're always looking to multitask and I'm not agreeing with that being the right thing. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a great way to connect. Totally. 
Well, on that note, I would love to get people to find you and listen to that podcast and have you a part of their everyday lives. Uh, where, where, where's the best place to go? I mean, there's so many platforms oh, these days to find a human. Where can we find you? <laughs> so I'm not, I, I, the best place to listen is Full Frontal Living, the Full Frontal Living podcast. That is my podcast. I primarily hang out on Instagram because again, let it be easy all the social media was sucking my life. So I went, I'm going to primarily hang out on Instagram. So you can find me on Instagram at Lisa Carpenter Inc. And honestly, I'm sucky at posting on Instagram, but I do an Insta, what are they called? Insta Insta stories. Oh, stories. I'll do a story every day and talk about something. Great. So that is the best place for people uh, to connect with me at the podcast and on Instagram. Love it. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you for having me. This was great. 